I'm Jeff Gedman with American Purpose. Uh, on behalf of our group, managing editor Michelle High and others, and uh, thanks to Sid Lipset, the chair or co-chair of our circle of friends who proposed the idea for this pr program today. Welcome to all of you. We have Carla Robbins from our editorial board in the moderator's chair. Carla is uh, the best kind of friend one can have, and I mean that to me and to our group. She is fiercely loyal, wicked smart, and forever critical in the good sort of way. One learns and one is tested and challenged always, and we need that for what we do. So Carla, thanks and welcome to you. And we have your friend and, and colleague Tom Etzel, the columnist from the New York Times who has had this magnificent, illustrious career as a journalist and now as a columnist and one of the most influential at the Times, but really in the country. Tom, welcome to you. Uh, our gratitude for writing about, at some length, Bill Galston's splendid essay for us recently in The American Purpose. And Bill, welcome to you. It's great to see you and we're delighted that you are a member of our editorial board. Carla, I'm gonna tell you uh, or tell our guests that we have 60 minutes or now 55 minutes, hard stop 1 p.m. Eastern. The first half of the program will be you in conversation with Tom asking questions. And then the latter half over to you, Carla, to moderate us in Q and A with the gallery. People can put questions in chat or raise your hand. I know we'll get to as many of you as you can, but welcome everybody. Welcome Tom Epsel and Carla, thanks. It's your show. Great, Jeff, thank you so much. And Sid, thanks so much for thinking of this. And Michelle, thank you as ever for being such a fabulous editor and thank everybody for being here. It's great, I see a lot of friends here. Um, so Tom, thank you so much for joining us today. For full, full disclosure, as Jeff said, Tom is not only a longtime colleague of mine from the Times and a longtime colleague of my husband's for the Post. He and his wife, Mary, um, are two of our closest friends, so no holds barred, okay? We're not gonna be nice to each other. That's the warning here. So our topic today is, are Americans ready to trust government again? But I'd love to start out because I'm a news person with uh, Tom's quick take on the ouster of Liz Cheney this week and what it means for the level of trust and coherence within the Republican Party. Um, just a few hours after she was forced out, um, the House Minority leader, leader McCarthy stood in front of the White House after meeting with Biden, with the president, to discuss infrastructure spending and said, I don't think anybody is questioning the legitimacy of the presidential election. I think this is all over with. So Tom, how do you think the base response to a statement like that, with Cheney out and with Elise Stefanik elected this morning, 134 to 46 to succeed her, is this all over with for the Republicans or is there more internal roiling to come? Well, the title of this program is, can, will Americans trust government, can Americans trust government again? I think that in fact, the real question is, can Republicans trust government? One of the phenomena that has taken place over the, with the Trump presidency really is that the Republican party has become more a cult than a political party. It believes in uh, fantasies basically and is not connected to democracy in the way that a normal major American party would be. So they reconnecting the Republican party to government and to reality is the fundamental obligation facing this country. Uh, the Democrats trust government and they basically abide by the rules of the game and independence in the main do also. The Republican party has gone off the rails to put it quite simply and although the obligation would seem to be on them to get back into the system, I think there are things that in a way fall on the Democratic Party and suggest that it may be, the burden may be on Democrats to make some concessions 
just ease things so that Republicans can get back, especially the Republicans who are so conspiracy minded, can get back into normal thinking. The, the, if you, most of what I read suggests that the Republican Party has sort of had a tipping point, largely because Republicans feel deeply threatened by liberalism, by the change in values, by the sexual revolution, by the women's rights revolution, by the civil rights revolution, all of these developments since roughly the early 1960s have been very disruptive to the basic way of life of Republicans. Uh, most people who are watching this uh, are not all that sympathetic to this suffering, but I think Democrats might want to start taking some steps to ease the pressure that these dissonant, mostly white working class, often Christian voters feel. And some of what the Democrats might want to do would be to tone down some of the more aggressive efforts to impose values on religious institutions that those religious institutions consider to be uh, against their faith. I think the Democratic Party might also consider toning down some of its more, what you would call woke policies, uh, including some of the sort of bathroom issues, the transgender issues, to make the entry back into the mainstream less threatening for these, for these Republicans who have become really uh, disenchanted and alienated from the American system. The most common question or a common question that was used to describe these voters was there, do you feel that you live in the country that you were brought up in? And most of these, many of them feel that they no longer are in the America that they knew and loved. Uh, most of these people are decent people. They, if you go out and talk to them or if you're in their community, they're very uh, often very community minded. They're very uh, helpful to other people, but they've gone over the edge to some extent. And they believe now, many of them, in what are basically fantasies. and. This is a very disturbing development. And I think, as I said, that some of the burden falls on Dem the Democratic Party. If, it, if we're gonna keep a democratic system, lowercase democratic system, I think that the uppercase Democrats have really the burden to take the initiative in this case. And it also, I think, would prove very beneficial to the Democrats and being able to win back some of these voters who, to their to that party, uh, if they were able to do this, and they would not be quite so alienating. But I've gone a long time in answer to your question, so go shoot again. So that is, a, you know, a cultural issue, and and will take quite a while to deal with. But you've written a lot about the underlying economic pressures that also lead to people's alienation. Um, and these are pressures that, that some of them are displaced through trade and globalization, but they're pressures that are not going to get better with time, and as you've also written about technology and displacement that are going to come, whether through artificial intelligence or the developments that are going to come in the future. Um, I suppose the question, you know, really becomes, you know, there are a lot of challenges that government and only government can solve, certainly economically, you know, the big ones, you know, replacing. Um, certainly Biden is betting on that. He's betting on the notion of when he talks about infrastructure, when he talks about these big, big problems, uh, he's betting that, you know, that, that, that government is the one that's, that is going to have to deal with this and that he's going to bring people back in by dealing with their fundamental economic anxieties. And that also goes to a question of trust, whether or not people believe that government is potentially a source of solving some of their economic anxieties. 
And what I suppose I'm wondering about is that in the wake of the pandemic, are people more ready to trust government? That's why I posed the question. The AP released a poll this week showing that 71% of Americans polled approved of President Biden's handling the pandemic, including 47% of Republicans and 59% of independents. And Gallup for the last 28 years does an annual governance poll. And for the first time this past September, so this is pre-election, um, asked the you know, first time since asking the question since 1992, a majority of Americans, 54%, said think think the government quote should do more to solve our country's problems. That's an increase of seven percentage points over the previous year. So I suppose the question is, given Biden's bet, you know that and and that he's basically asking for a lot of money to address really fundamental economic dislocations, or at least that's the argument he's making. Are these people who you are describing as culturally alienated, are they reachable um, on the question of government helping them with fundamental economic dislocation issues? Uh, in fact, I think they are, but the, the, what, what I've seen is that a substantial number of the, what you might call hardcore Trump voters, white non-college uh, working class uh, voters heavily in the Midwest and otherwise, they have liberal economic views and they want redistributive policies adopted. Not all of them. There's a big segment that are really small businessmen, people, store owners, and who think more in traditional terms of deficits and uh, cutting back on spending. But a very large or a substantial percentage are people who have conservative values, but liberal economic stances. That's why Trump actually did well. He was perceived by these voters in 19, 2016 as a moderate, which sounds crazy now, but in fact, because he said he would protect Social Security and Medicare, he convinced a lot of voters that he was not a threat in the traditional Republican sense to things that they value highly, which are those are both redistributive programs uh, that benefit everybody. They are very, these voters are supportive of this. They are also generally though supportive of universal programs, not ones that are directed to specific racial or ethnic or gender groups. Uh, so it's not quite as simple as just pouring out money. But the Biden strategy in that sense is a po politically is a reasonable strategy. It may have some problems with inflation and, and, and other issues, but his approach is a good one and it addresses one half the problem. But the cultural alienation is very substantial. These are people who you would, everyone says, what's the matter with Kansas question? Well, the culture is the issue. Uh, and you have to do something to lessen this sense of cultural alienation driven by the perceived threat of liberalism in the broad sense as being a very disruptive, uh, socially disorganizing, family disorganizing force. And people feel that. And I think to get over the hump you can't not address uh, the cultural issues. Addressing the economic issues is a good idea and will do substantially a lot of what you describe. But I think culture cannot be discounted in this at all. But I want to add one more thing to this. I mean, and maybe it's the third factor, or maybe it's a it's related to to more to culture, but. To go back to my original question, which is, you know, people had a mistrust of government during the Reagan years, and but it was all about profligate spending and waste, fraud, and abuse. You know, you know, they they didn't trust the government to spend them their money. Their money. Um, people may not trust the government because they feel it's pushing them too hard culturally. Okay, that's or and they feel that society is pushing them too hard culturally. I understand that. 
there is something different to my mind when we get into the world of that you were talking about in the beginning, this sort of frightening X-Files quality of world that not just the government's going to waste your money or perhaps try to foist values on you that you don't agree with, but that somehow the government's out, out there to poison you with untested vaccines or that there is, you know, they're running a conspiracy for child sex trafficking or that there's a deep state out there that's going to steal the elections with Venezuelan voting machines, which goes back to this original sort of I mean, vertiginous state set of statements here that you, you oust Liz Cheney because she's saying, you know, that, that 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 Trump lost the election and it's a threat to democracy to say anything else. And then a few hours later, McCarthy stands in front of the White House and says nobody's questioning the legitimacy of the election. Um, this, you know, this very strange authoritarian tendency to stand in front of a black wall and say it's white, to say that you have your truth, I have mine. That's something new to my mind. That is not, I can't draw a line from the 1960s to that. I can't draw a line from the Reagan revolution to that. I think there's something qualitatively different about that. That mistrust almost in reality. I see this of having worked in authoritarian societies, having worked in the former Soviet Union, I recognize that. And so is this a third level of mistrust that's out there? And how does one address that? Um, is this just driven by cultural alienation? Is this driven by economic displacement? Um, and does is it going to take fixing all those other problems before we get back to everybody at least having a base level agreement about what the truth is? Uh, I think that's a very good question. I'm not sure I have a great answer for it. What I do know is that the <clears throat> authoritarianism going back to 1992 and before the percentage of Democrats who had authoritarian leanings and the percentage of Republicans who had such leanings were about equal. Starting in 1992, which was basically the beginning of the Clinton administration, Bill Clinton, uh, the divide between the two parties began and the Republicans became more the home of authoritarian leaning voters and Democrats became more the home of uh, liberal sexual revolution. The authoritarian voter is often one who has conservative cultural leanings. So all of these mesh together. And it may be that Bill Clinton and the role that his wife played and all of that exacerbated for many voters the sense for many conser culturally conservative voters, the idea of a, of a liberalism run amok. I I'm not sure about that, but that's also, if you look at 1994, which the most dramatic element in the 1994 election was the abandonment of white working class voters from voting for Democrats in Congress. That was a congressional off year election. White men without college degrees, their they went, their percentage voting for Democrats fell by 20 percentage points. That is a huge drop, and it is the first sort of angry white man to emerge in a, in the, in a clear sense. Something was going on in the early 1990s, and I think it in part had to do with Bill Clinton uh, and, and Hillary Clinton and the way they were perceived. Uh, and I could go longer on this, but I, I, uh, I, well, very briefly, I think that Bill Clinton created a sense of betrayal among many of these voters. He appealed very strongly and did well. He, in fact, won with a plurality, but he still won the white working class vote. I think his immediate shift upon taking office to the issues of gays in the military, to having a uh, cabinet that looked like America, all the fights of finding an attorney general who was acceptable. They all had elitist problems. Uh, all women all had elitist problems of having uh, uh, maids or people that worked at home who were not citizens. There were a whole series of things where Clinton, basically, I think many 
of his course of, of his the supporters that he had won over in 1992 by 1994 they felt that he had really failed them after they put their faith in him and but that, but that's a speculation the i think a process began then with this authoritarian issue which you mentioned and it's very relevant but i'm not sure anybody has a real grasp on what goes into it began and and it became the do, a dominant factor by the time we get to uh, Donald Trump and the uh, uh, authoritarianism became or a sympathy for authoritarianism became a central characteristic for the voters who, who supported Donald Trump. So to, you started out by saying the, the Republican Party had gone off the rails, you know, and for the longest time for me as a as a reporter, I had a really hard time saying, you know, one side bad, one side not so bad, you know, it was the sort of Norm Ornstein, you know, when Tom Mann wrote that fabulous book it originally, and, and I had a really hard time with those chapters that said that we in the press were, you know, couldn't say directly that the Republicans, and this was, you know, 2011, 2012, that the Republicans bore much more responsibility for the divisiveness and, 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 and the inability for Congress to get anything done. But if you, you I must say that on a certain level, I understand, you know, the time you have more sympathy with the Democratic Party, so you're more critical of the Democratic Party because you see the possibility of them making changes. You want them to make changes. You want them to get things back on track. But basically what you're talking about is enabling a bunch of people who are, who are tearing the country apart. You know, you're, you're saying, I don't know what you're talking about, what percentage of people really, really are that off the rails versus people who just, when polled, say, yay, my team, the Republican team. So yes, I'm going to say the election was actually really stolen. I mean, how much are, you know, are, are we, anybody supposed to enable people who genuinely think that it's a bad idea to have affirmative action, who genuinely think that it's a bad idea to have women in, you know, a cabinet that looks like America? I personally don't think those are bad ideas, but damn, I'm a woman. What the hell, you know? Um, you know, do we really want to enable people, you know, the 20% of the population that genuinely, you know, believes that we should be living in a 1950s black and white sitcom? I, I think uh, I, I disagree with you. I think we should. That's democracy. But what we should be careful is when they don't accept the premises of democratic governance, uh, when they feel so separated from government that they turn at the extreme to the insurrection of uh, January of uh, January 6th uh, and to the extreme in Congress where they uh, decisive majorities of Republicans vote basically that the Rep that the election was corrupted uh, that that's off the rails. People have a right to believe, to wish it was the 1950s, to wish it was the 1840s. I, I mean, that's 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 life. Uh, but and I think that those people are not bad people. They often are very good and decent people. I spent a lot of time, especially as a reporter, talking door to door to people in white working class neighborhoods. And in some black working class neighborhoods, and in, in, in general, they're all these. They're bad. Go ahead. But Tom, I'm not suggesting they're bad people. What I'm questioning is the suggestion that you're saying that the Democratic Party should back away from, you know, pressing for, you know, for a cabinet that looks like America, for the sort of pressing for for fundamental cultural and social changes, which many people would say have been long deferred for for, you know, that that if you look at you know, still pretty fundamental, you know, racial and, and, and economic problems in this country. Should you, know, why should the Democratic Party back away from this because of a certain number of people who are insurrectionists? I'm not saying back away. In fact, you can appoint any cabinet you want, but I wouldn't talk about it all the time. Uh, and I wouldn't make a big deal about it all the time. I would, uh, and I would talk about the universality and the benefits that flow to all Americans from most programs. 
and uh, uh, the dem democratic liberalism and the basic goals it has are not all perfect. There are a lot of imperfections in some of these programs. Uh, and I think there are ways to deal with these things without being heavy handed. And I think the Democratic Party has had a tendency to be heavy handed and has been reluctant to step in when it needs to step in. As for example, the defund the police. I think that did hurt the Democratic Party. And I think Democrats really needed to step in and say, this is just dead wrong. Uh, police perform a function and people of all races support having police protection in their neighborhoods. This is a fringe idea. Uh, I think that the Democratic Party, when it that what people fear about the Democratic Party and liberalism is that it goes too far, has good impulses, but goes over the edge and it tries to push things too far too fast. And it doesn't examine the costs that it, that it, it will impose policies that sound great because they recognize the needs of a, of a marginalized group but they will impose costs on other groups. The other group that has often been borne the brunt of these costs has been the white working class. Uh, they have, maybe they had too much of a benefit before in the, in the leading up to all the changes now, but now their children who are not the ones who are the guilty ones to accept have often been the ones to suffer they're applying for a job as a policeman. They may not, they may score high enough to get there, but they won't make it because they're not on the list that will, that they get bumped off the list. There are all kinds of issues like this where there are legitimate grievances on the, on the what we would call the right. And they need to be, to some extent, acknowledged and rectified. And there has been a long history of, of liberals just not recognizing what they were doing to cause problems for people who should be their voters. And they lost those voters uh, all mass over time. So I want to turn it over. We have a lots of people in the chat and they're, it's great because there are fistfights breaking out <laughs> in a nice way. Um, but uh, um, I, and you know, of course, Tom, I always agree with you, but I had I had to provoke a response, of course. You had a you had a, a, a headline for your for your column. And do you write your headlines? No. Um, oh, uh, but it was a good had good good headline. Should Biden emphasize race or class or both or none of the above, which is really basically the question that you're that you're you're posing here. I mean, how's he doing? I mean, given what you said, I mean he is He's got a pretty left agenda in the sense of heavy government, you know, involvement. And but at the same time, you say a lot of these people are economically progressive, redistributionist. Um, how is he doing, given what given what you're saying? Um, you know, he tends to emphasize the benefits for all, at least when I'm listening most of the time. So, what's your assessment? I would uh, give him a B plus. Uh, that that's pretty good. Uh, uh, it's it's not quite an A, but it, it is an honor grade, at least in the old style. I, if I got a B plus, I was pretty happy in college. Uh, that was a hundred years ago. The uh, uh, you did really well in your GREs, though. I know that. <laughs> uh, but at any rate, the. Uh, uh, I, I think on the whole he's doing pretty well, but it, it, there's some areas that I'm ambivalent about. But um, on the whole, he's he's doing much better than I expected to tell you the truth. And is he taming the Democratic Party? Uh, that is going to the 2022 election is going to be the big test. He probably will lose the house, but if he keeps losses to a minimum would be to his credit. And the other big question, he's got these two huge bills or three bills really, 
He's got the two big spending bills, four trillion plus, and he's got the uh, uh, House one, Senate one bills for uh, that may right. now get modified by what Joe Manchin is suggesting. I'm not sure, but uh, uh, those are. The, I think it's in fact that the. Senate one, House one bills on election reform or some form of it are crucial to the future of the Democratic Party. Uh, and the other ones would be, are crucial to the Biden agenda, which in terms of it being transformative, we won't, it, it has to be enacted in order to test whether it's transformative. And if he doesn't win approval of the two big spending bills, uh, it'll be a setback in both to him and to his ability to try out this as an approach to restore the vitality of the Democratic Party. Uh, he does represent a real shift from past Democrats on this front. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll see. And your prediction for where the Republicans are going at this point? My original question. Well, that's, that's the, the, the dangerous thing. Here's this party that's sort of kind of wacky and they're gonna probably have control of the Senate, I mean the House, and could well have control of the Senate. That Senate is, is certainly closer and it's possible the Democrats could retain it. It all depends uh, uh, in, in the Senate, the big advantage the Democrats have is that Trump may push and successfully push the nomination of basically nutcases for some of these Senate seats who then can be beaten by Democrats. Uh, I think probably Democrats should be contributing money to the Trump PAC in that sense. Uh, uh, but the, uh, but I think that the, keeping the house would be extraordinary if, if he did that. If, if, if Biden were able to do that, that would be a very significant development and would indicate the Republican Party is actually in big trouble. Uh, but but I, I would not, I'm a betting person and I wouldn't bet on that. So I want to turn this over to the group with, I have got many more questions, I always do, but I want to turn it over to the group. And we've been having a conversation more than a set of questions, but we do have a very good question to start from Ned Far Farrow, who describes himself as a self, as a cranky conservative, um, although it's not a particularly cranky question. Um, how does trust in local and state governments compare to the federal government, especially after the pandemic? Um, and then ask the question, why is, you know, why has, if there is consistently greater trust in local and state government, why is that translated to a greater transfer of political power to, you know, um, to the federal government um, you know, using spending as a metric? Well, you know, I mean, there, that's a, there's, there's a lot of, there a lot of explanations for that one. I, I mean, let's, let's start with, with the first one, which is, there is, you know, on polling consistently more more trust in, in local, whether it's local media, local government. Um, how have local governments done? Has it been consistent? It's been, pretty, to my mind, been pretty inconsistent, you know, state to state. Um, coming out of this, you know, is, is there going to be a different relationship and a different perception of, of state and local government um, in, after the pandemic? And should we think about transferring different responsibilities to, to, to state and local government? Should we rethink that relationship? Um, I, I just, to be honest, I'm not familiar with data on favorability towards state and local government. I assume it's pretty hard. People feel pretty close that the problem is that, uh, for example, Republicans uh, probably feel pretty trustworthy, feel a lot of trust towards government in states where their party controls the, uh, the government, which is uh, in slightly more than half, or not half, well, it's more states have Republican control than Democratic control. I'm not sure about the local government. It depends, I suspect that Republicans distrust city governments, uh, but may well support local, more rural county 
and other governments, but I, I, uh, I, I just don't have a good answer to that question. So, uh, I apologize. Um, so questions, hands raised? Bill Galston, I want you to ask a question. You wrote such a great piece. I'm sure you have many questions for your friend, Tom. You're I muted, call Bill. Bill, you're muted. Now I'm unmuted. Thank uh, you. Look, uh, I could ask all sorts of very broad gauge questions, but since Tom and I have been batting this ball back across the net for a long time, let me ask, let me ask a narrow one. And Tom, it won't surprise you uh, to hear that it will be about the Clinton years, because I'm somewhat implicated in them. Uh, and uh, as I read the data, it is not clear at all. As a matter of fact, I think it's simply wrong to say that the white working class fled the Democratic Party in presidential elections, either in 1992 or 1996 because of the persona of Bill Clinton, you know, the af you know, the affect of the draft dodger, the pot smoker, the philanderer, the enabler of, uh, you know, of, of a feminist wife, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he, act he actually fought uh, first George H.W. Bush and then Bob Dole to about a draw among white working class voters, and he did better among white working class voters in 96 than he did in 92. So, you know, Hegel wants to find a tragedy as a beautiful theory felled by an inconvenient fact. Are you, sh how sure are you that the Clinton years were pivotal years in these developments? I, one, I think that 94 was a pivotal year in the decline of the Democratic Party. And uh, comparing, in 92, he, Clinton did well with the white working class uh, winning a plurality. In 1996, he ran against a very weak uh, candidate, Bob Dole. Uh, he triangulated and he tried to, he under uh, Dick, what's his name's guidance, he tried to mute the problems that I was citing, and he uh, was somewhat successful. The Republican Party in the meantime, and I'm going to have a hard time with my dates here, but I think the Republican Party became very anti-government and shut down government just at basically the wrong time. Clinton was able to turn that. He was a very good politician. He turned that into a liability for the Republican Party and basically shifted all responsibility to them. And it was also at the time, I believe, of the Oklahoma City bombing, which was not a good, no longer was a good moment to be quite so explicitly anti-government. So he, I think, lucked out. But he, I think he began he had a great opportunity to build the Democratic Party uh, into a much stronger and basically to restore its ties to its roots, uh, which was his goal in 1992, and then to affirm them and keep them there. Uh, and uh, we can have a lot of arguments about this, but I think he should have done welfare reform before he did try to do health care. Uh, welfare reform would have been much more effective. And as it happened, he does welfare reform much later, but it, and it does ease the hostility to him later when he does that, but he doesn't do it as an immediate follow-up to his 92 campaign when it would have had a more sustained effect on his presence and on the party's strength. When he came into office, the Republican Party was really terrified of him. And they thought, uh oh, here's a guy who understands the problems of his own party and he could really hurt us. He, the, the things he did wrong from the word go, I could, 
He tried to push a government stimulus spending bill that was really just a bunch of, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, favors. It was a bill of favoritism and it got defeated. His first bill got defeated. It was the worst thing a, a president can do is to, to lose his first, uh, first major legislative initiative. Uh, with more time, I could think of more things that he did that were problematic. He, he allowed gays in the military to d dominate his uh, first six months in the office, uh, which was not an issue that was at the top. He could have said, this issue is one that I said I would address, but it's not my top priority. I'm gonna postpone it till later. Instead, he allowed it to fester and to cause more and more problems for him. He, uh, I, 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 I thought he had a great chance when elected and he blew that chance what, out of the wall. Well, if there were a lot more time, I would do a follow-up, but, but Carla, in deference to the long, no doubt long list of questions, uh, I'll allow Tom to have the last word on this one for now. For, for now. now. As, as, as soon as as soon as we're out of out of lockdown, we're gonna we're gonna do this across dinner. I'm looking forward to it. Um, there is a question actually that was came direct to me, so I'm gonna ask ask her to do it for the group. Um, Shirley Marty Hargis, um, can you can you ask your question? It's a good question. Yes. First, thing, thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Edsel, for being with us. I I look forward to reading your piece after this um, after this talk. My question for you. Um, Often I hear and read the quote, don't always talk about it, read diversity. And I appreciate the opportunity to be able to ask about it because it's not, it's not often on the spaces that I can ask that question. And so I want to understand what folks mean by that comment. And are, are you saying that as long as diversity in terms, messages such as that are not constantly mentioned, do you envision that there will be more across the board opportunity? Say that, for example, there's no affirmative action. The, the liberals don't push so hard on diversity, constantly speaking about it often. In your opinion, do we see folks in leadership that represent America, not only in race, but women, et cetera? I, personally, I think Democrats should do diversity Mm -hmm. but not talk about it so much. I think they should have cabinets and sub-cabinet appointees that reflect the diversity of the nation and just do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think focusing on it turns the issue into one of a zero-sum competition. Right. That you want to avoid saying, I'm giving X to Y so a you're you're out you got you you want to just do what you do and do your diversity but you don't announce it in the sense that you then by saying but when you say i'm appointing uh 20 hispanics over here that may be heard by blacks or by whites as those are 20 jobs that are not going to whites or blacks. People tend to view politics from a self-interested point of view and from a zero sum point of view. You, I think a Democrat wants to avoid zero sum politics. And uh, th that is the problem with identity politics in general. And I think of, by avoiding it, you can do more of it, but you just do it. You don't say it as if you follow it. Okay, thank you for such a nuanced response to my question. I appreciate it. Sure, anytime. So we have um, comments about issue of the issue of the election, the election bills that are out there and, and voter suppression. Um, you know, you, you're talking about the midterm elections, and, and I'm just sort of wondering about your insights into these bills that, that have, have been passed in a variety of states, and Florida and Texas and all. I mean, is there even going to be a level playing field for the midterms? I mean, how much do, does one, 
one have to worry about uh, about the fairness of the system in the next few years if this legislation goes 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 forward in more states and certainly in key states that seem to have already done it i uh, i mean i think it is a problem i think the voter suppression stuff <laughs> the republican party in general is in this posture of defending a declining constituency it, the white working class is declining the uh, the states where it, it wins uh, uh, well some are gaining some are losing uh but it, it, it's in a uh it has to reduce it has to de-level the competitive the playing field in order to win and it's doing that it did it and it does it through uh, gerrymandering it has it's much easier for Republicans to gerrymander for a lot of reasons than Democrats. And they do it, and they do it very effectively. And they're going to use all these tools, which are really denying full voter participation. And now they're doing it even knowing that there is really very little evidence of any voter fraud or anything like that. There's a good story on the front page of the Times about that today. The, uh, and I think that that is one of the very worrisome things about the Republican Party in the sense that it no longer wants to compete in the normal sense of competing in the United States. And it's now, it has quite a while actually, since 2010. As soon as Obama won a majority uh, in 2008, the fear of the Republican Party of this dem of being demographically uh, drowned became intense, and it became the dominant strategic issue for the party, in the sense of gerrymandering and passing voter restriction legislation. And that has just become even more so now the case now. And I think that is a uh, is a serious problem for democratic governments. And American governments, the whole history of America has been a, an expansion of the franchise. And they, the Republican Party, now basically stands against that tradition. And they are doing it really with impunity to, in given states. And uh, that, that, that is a very worrisome thing. Is there a narrative? Is there a way of pushing back to that in a way that it isn't seen? You know that, that it isn't isn't that well people can understand. I mean, what's more American than 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 voting? You, and you would think so, but it, apparent, it so far has not deterred the party. And most of the places where they are doing this, they, and basically, it's the only places where they can do it are places where they have unified control of state government. So the only pushback they get is from uh, Democrats who are in the minority in the legislatures in these states. And then a lot of voters just perceive this as a partisan fight and they don't see the substance to it. Uh, maybe Democrats nationally need to get a much stronger message on this whole issue because it does go to the core of of, of of the kind of government that we have. So I want to be um, uplifting here because this is getting really depressing. But uh, Kevin Kozark makes, I think, a very good point. Um, uh, Kevin, do you want to you want to voice your point? Sure. Uh, you know, regular Americans um, don't pay a lot of attention to the actual operations of government. And so to a degree, they, their perception of whether it's doing well and is trustworthy or not is, is taken from tips they get from elites that they happen to follow. And I think a very clear development we've seen in the last 20 or 30 years, and the internet's put this on steroids, is the development of dueling elite influencers who basically take a kind of quasi-parliamentary mindset so if there's a Republican in the White House, you're gonna have a huge number of media influencers who are like, my God, this, this is all going to hell. The government is being abused. It's incipient tyranny, et cetera, et cetera. You know, same thing happens. 
as soon as Joe Biden gets into the White House, let's all talk, everybody on the right wants to start talking about, oh, he's wrecking the place, he's running up the debt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And these attitudes are being pushed down and it's just with the presidency switching back and forth, this is a worrisome dynamic over the long run because everybody in America at one point or another is being told government stinks and it's failing you. You know, it's just a matter of whether you're in the positive or negative phase, but you're gonna keep getting it which I think is just probably fostering a long-term corrosion uh, of trust. Uh, so I don't quite... it... Go ahead. I mean, it, what Kevin, Kevin is saying is, is you got Fox News on one side and you got Rachel Maddow on the other and people are, you know, people have their own realities and, and, and it gets more and more tribalized. You've written a lot about that. I suppose I suppose the hope was that was that Biden could talk a language that could cut through that. Um, that given where he came from, given his politics in the past, that he could that he could speak a language that cut through that. Um, so far, you know, I mean, I spent some time on Fox News. There's certainly no sign he's cutting through there. Um, if anything, we seem to be going more and more into our own corners. Uh, I don't know what you do because the the what you're describing are market driven decisions to some extent. But well, Fox had made a market calculation that there was a lot of money to be made by appealing to conservatives, uh, and then places like Newsmax and others have followed suit, and you have Rachel Maddow and. Uh, uh, MSNBC and to a certain extent CNN trying to follow a, uh, a different strategy that basically is to be liberal. Uh, so, uh, when you have market incentives like this, I don't know quite how you correct them, but I think the other, other underlying problem with this is that the traditional mainstream media allowed itself to be defined as liberal. And I think you see that at my publication, The Times, and I think you see that at the, at the Washington Post where I used to work, that there is a underlying liberalism in the mainstream media. And I would say that's there too even on, on the network news that people on the right sense and that there is not a corrective that has got validity and credibility uh, to this divisiveness that you see on the, on the much more explicitly partisan cable media and other sources. So I, I, you're getting it. You're raising a good question that needs a lot more work, but I, I would not exempt the mainstream media from being a subject that needs to be examined more carefully. So I, I, because I do want to, not that I am a, in any way, shape, or form, Pollyanna-like person, but I, I do see a small glimmer of hope to go back to this AP polling. Um, you know, the, the notion that 71% that, that of Americans polled approved of President Biden's handling of the pandemic, including 47% of Republicans and 59% of independents. I mean, consistently, you know, polling has been on most policies, you know, tribal, they've been yay team. It doesn't matter, you know, that the economy could be exactly the same from January 19th to January 21st. And the, and the perception would be, you know, pre and post inauguration. For you know, it's 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 fabulous. On, you know, if you're a Republican, it's fabulous under a Republican president, and then suddenly two days later, it turns to absolute, you know, dog poop on on that's a that's a, actually a technical term um, on once a, there's a Democrat in, in in the White House. I'm just you know maybe this is just one thing, but if the perception of competence in government and handling something that is in a once in the lifetime horror show like a pandemic. Is there a possibility of building on that? 
is there a possibility of building on that and creating more faith that government is is has competence and that government is even handed you know that, that that's pushing out vaccines to anybody who wants it all right sure all right uh this is what Biden's strategy is, and I, and I, I think he has potential in what he's saying. Uh, he's only, it needs more time to be really affirmed, and, but it certainly does have potential, uh, and I wouldn't rule that out. But uh, I've been covering politics for a long time. 50 years really. And I have found as a general rule of thumb, you're better off being pessimistic than being optimistic. <laughs> and, uh, you made uh, a fabulous career out of that, Tom. <laughs> things go south much more often than they go north. Mm -hmm. And uh, at any rate, so I'll say trying to be optimistic, but I, would not bet the house on it. So we have just a few minutes left and 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 Dan Smith, I believe it is, who 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 emailed a question and and will accuse us of, of, of a conspiracy here at the American Purpose by by not asking his question, although I don't think either of us is particularly competent on this topic. Um, he's asked, why isn't the media picking up Josh Rogan's explosive reporting on the NIH Fauci and the Wuhan lab? Um, it seems like a bombshell story. Rogan has been doing everything he can to get it out there. Um, that, and, and, and basically saying that you know that that the media is intentionally covering up while sim simultaneously propping up someone responsible for the pandemic. Fauci is a savior. Why would we trust the government? This perception that that there's the media and the government are are intentionally covering up you know, the, the notion that the virus was created in, in the Wuhan lab. Do you think that there is a conspiracy to cover this up? I mean, personally, I don't think we, I personally I think we need to have more information about what happened. And I know the Chinese are blocking a full investigation, but do you think that there is a conspiracy to prop Fauci up and between the, between the government and the press? Well, is his argument that, that there's a conspiracy that includes Fauci and the Chinese? Uh, I don't think there's much evidence for that at all. There is certainly, uh, at, and I think the Times again had a story on this of some 24 prominent uh, scientists pushing for more examination of what the original sources of the virus were. Was it out of a, a laboratory or was it out of some kind of an animal can contamination or both? Uh, I, I don't think the media is covering up the, the role of the Chinese. That it, that I, the, the question is a little bit uh, out of right field. Well, I will tell you that of all the years I worked in Washington, if anybody in the government ever called me and asked me to cover something up, that would have been, you know, a guarantee that we would have been pushing to put it on the front. That's why we exist. If if we, if we, as as Tom says, if betting on betting on things turning out bad is is has been a been a key for his career, you know, pushing against the government has been a key, a key for our career our career as well. It's it's you know we're paid to say the emperor has no clothes, so uh, and you know that's that's certainly what what we're paid to do. And certainly what we do as well, American Purpose. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Jeff and Sydney and thank Tom Essel for being as ever, absolutely extraordinary and thank much you beloved. Much. And thank you. You were great. So, so thank Carla, thank you. Tom. But before I properly thank you and Tom and indeed thanks at Lipset for uh, your initiative in helping us create this program, I will take the liberty of mentioning that in the same vein, we continue Monday at 12 noon Eastern with Kate Epstein of Rutgers, who's written a marvelous and substantial essay for us. Kate is a, she says in the essay, a lifelong Democrat, a fierce opponent of Donald J. Trump, but who fears in her world, what you said, Tom, is true, that parts of the left has gone too fast, too far with unfortunate 
unintended consequences. To the matter at hand, Carla, what a marvelous moderator you are and friend and ally. And to you, Tom, what an encouraging and heartening conversation because you were so direct, so candid, so clear and so illuminating. Someone was saying to me in chat, isn't it nice that we don't have liberals and conservatives shouting at each other or one side affirming friends on the same side? And you really helped us a lot with that today. And then to all of you, I always feel like, um, is it, it's been a long time since I've flown, I guess, is it the purser or, or the pilot who says, thank you for choosing our airline because we know you have a lot of choice. Well, well, you all have a lot of choice of Zoom discussion groups and you're busy and time is limited. So thank you so much for making time today. And Tom Edsel, that was splendid. And Carla, wonderful. Thank you all very much. Have a great afternoon. Good and safe weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff.